Good day, everyone. We're going to be continuing our discussion on intermolecular forces. Right now, focusing more specifically on dipole-dipole interactions and hydrogen bonding. Let's jump into it. So, previously we discussed London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces, um, any molecule has it by virtue of having electrons in it. And recall, um, so let's just say, for example, let's look at argon down there. So, we have this random electron movement in argon. They're moving about in their orbitals. And sometimes maybe they happen to align more on one side than the other. So when they're more on one side, that creates an electron rich side and an electron poor side, therefore making what's a temporary dipole. It's temporary because it's not going to last. The electrons are still moving around. But one side has a partial negative and a partial positive charge. Now, if that temporary dipole interacts with another argon, for example, the electron rich, rich side is going to repel electron density away from it, whereas the electron poor side is going to pull electron density toward it. So what we get here is another temporary dipole um, induced from that temporary dipole. So the whole idea of one dispersion forces comes down to this idea of polarizability. Generally speaking, the larger a molecule is and the more surface area available for a molecule to interact, the more polarizable it is, and therefore the more London dispersion forces. Um, it will enjoy. Okay, so another type of temporary interaction is what's called an ion dipole interaction or an ion induced dipole. So down there we have, for example, sodium plus interacting with argon. Now that positive charge, what is a positive charge going to do with electron density? Well, that's right, it's going to attract it. So what we end up getting then is an ion induced dipole because this temporary dipole in argon, it's not permanent, the electrons are shifted more toward the positive charge, but if we remove that positive charge, that dipole is going to disappear and the electrons will be back in their random movement. So, hence, temporary dipoles. So, London dispersion forces rely on these temporary dipoles. What we're going to be focusing on now, though, are permanent dipoles and a very special permanent dipole called, um, well, a motif from a permanent dipole called hydrogen bonding. Let's take a closer look. To do this, let's look at two different molecules. In one corner, we have butane. In another corner, propanol. Very similar molecular weights and very similar in general shapes. So we would predict that they would have pretty similar intermolecular forces, well, in terms of their London dispersion forces, okay? Now let's look at the boiling points of these molecules. Remember, boiling points are reflective of the respective intermolecular forces. So butane, oh, it, has a boiling point of negative one degree Celsius. All right, well, that's, that's kind of a low temperature. How about propanol? Propanol, what is your boiling point? 97 degrees Celsius, what? That's a notable difference. Okay, so what's going on here? Why does butane, which has pretty similar molecular weight, have such a lower um, boiling point and therefore lower intermolecular forces? Well, enter dipole-dipole interactions. Dipole-dipole interactions are these attractive intermolecular forces that are the result of partial positive and partial negative charges. We can basically almost think of it as molecules having an internal magnet of sorts built into them. So if we look at propanol, the very electronegative oxygen is going to be hoarding electron density, pulling it away from both the carbon and the hydrogen. I only have the hydrogen illustrated here, but um, the carbon that's attached to the oxygen will also have a notable partial positive charge. So, when compared to butane, which has no dipole, propanol with its dipole is going to have considerably more intermolecular forces by virtue of having that. In fact, propanol also has another type of intermolecular force known as hydrogen bonding. It's a special type, a more pronounced dipole that we get when we have a hydrogen that's bonded to either an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine. And we'll explore that one um, in more depth in just a few slides. So let's kind of envision what's happening here. Down there, we have a propanol. And if that propanol is interacting with another propanol, these two propanols can interact not only through their London dispersion forces, but also through this dipole-dipole interaction. The partial negatives and the partial positives are going to interact with each other to help create a stronger bond between them. This stronger bond explains that almost 100 degrees Celsius difference in the boiling points. Again, considerably more intermolecular forces available for propanol. 
Um, here we're taking another look at dipole-dipole interactions, um, specifically with hydrochloric acid. So HCl, hydrogen, not very electronegative. Chlorine, pretty electronegative. As a result, we end up having a molecule that has a partial positive end on hydrogen and a partial negative end on chlorine. And they can contract each other. Again, I like to think of it as a kind of a magnet built in inside the molecule. It's not magnetism that's pulling them together, just an analogy. We can also use something called electrostatic potential maps to help better visualize this. And the way that these kind of work is the electron clouds around the molecule are depicted. And the areas that are red show areas of high electron density. So those are the areas that have um, partial negative charges. Whereas the blue, those are the electron poor sides. Those are going to be the sides with partial positive charges. And HCl can interact either through um, that kind of linear motif that we have depicted there, or we also have another way that they could interact. They could have more of a side to side overlap where again, the partial positive and partial negatives are attracting each other, um, a la what we know about electrostatic interactions. Um, unlike charges attract each other, partial positive, partial negative, voila. Now, hydrogen bonding, let's look at this trend. What's the deal with this trend? So look at all these various molecules we have. On the y-axis, we have the boiling points, again, um, reflective of the intermolecular forces. On the x-axis, we have the molecular weights. Notice here that the highest boiling point of all these molecules is H2O. Now, something to note about H2O with respect to its mass. It's one of the lightest molecules on here, and yet it has the highest boiling point. So remember, generally speaking, the greater mass a molecule has, the more London dispersion forces it has. So there must be something else at play here. Dipole-dipole interactions, certainly, but also enter hydrogen bonding. So we've got a partial negative on that oxygen. We've got partial positives on these hydrogens. And whenever you have a hydrogen that's bonded to um, either a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen, it's such a pronounced difference in electronegativity that you end up getting a really notable partial negative and a really notable partial positive that create, in general, a pretty um, unifying bond here. So oh, there we have it. There is our hydrogen bond being depicted. And some terminology. We call the hydrogen part of the hydrogen bond the hydrogen bond donor. Then the lone pair of electrons, there needs to be a lone pair of electrons available um, for this to take place. We call the hydrogen bond acceptor. So here the oxygen um, with its electron rich partial negative, the lone pair of electrons that we have on there is um, being considered the acceptor here, whereas the hydrogen is the donor. So here's a whole bunch of different hydrogen bonds being depicted. Again, the three types of bonds that can do it are hydrogen fluorine, hydrogen oxygen, and hydrogen nitrogen. The hydrogen that's going to be the donor of the hydrogen bond must be directly attached, bonded to one of these atoms. So if you have a carbon and that carbon is attached to an oxygen on one side and a hydrogen on the other, that hydrogen is attached to a carbon. It can't do hydrogen bonding. But if that hydrogen is attached to one of these very small, very electronegative atoms, it can do it. So the commonality of all three of these atoms, they're very small, they're in the second period of the periodic table, and they're all very electronegative. So I like to think of it as hydrogen bonding is fun. Like fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, it's, it's fun. It's also very important and very useful and we'll see is um, sort of the impetus behind the fidelity of DNA replication. Thanks, hydrogen bonding. Let's talk about that now. So here we have um, the four types of bases that we can find in DNA. We've got adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Now, a DNA strand for humans consists of about 3 billion of these base pairs. When DNA is replicating, in order to maintain the fidelity of the DNA, it wants to be able to create perfect transcripts that match the genome. Well, get this. Adenine has two hydrogen bonding sites, which match nicely with the thymine. Guanine and cytosine, on the other hand, have three hydrogen bonding sites. So actually, this number of hydrogen bonding sites available almost creates these perfect puzzle pieces that will match and pair with each other. And that's really cool. And it's not a perfect system. There's some other mechanisms involved to make sure that um, DNA replication is um, 
going according to plan, but this works really, really, really well. And it's super duper neat. So thanks, hydrogen bonding. Look at that. And if you use um, a technology called PCR, um, the polymerase chain reaction at some point, um, actually you can, based on the amount of adenines and thymines versus guanines and cytosines you have, because one makes two hydrogen bonds and the other one makes three hydrogen bonds, at one point you have to melt the DNA apart and um, actually the melting point of that strand of DNA differs based on, um, it's gonna be lower the more adenines and thymines you have, the more guanines and cytosines, those are held together more tightly, it's gonna take a higher heat. Really neat stuff. So let's take a moment to do a clicker question. I'm just going to awkwardly pause for a moment. You can pause this video and try this problem. We have a few molecules here. Um, and in, case, in one case, we actually have a salt. We've got sodium chloride. We've got one chloro, um, that is pentanol. We've got pentane and, um, sorry, one chloropentane is molecule number two. Then we have pentane and then we have one pentanol. So take a moment and see if you can rank these in order from lowest to highest melting point using your knowledge of intermolecular forces. Go. You did it. The answer is E. So if we're gonna rank these, the one with the lowest melting point is going to be pentane. Now these have pretty similar molecular weights with each other. Um, pentane actually is the lightest of all these, but pentane only has London dispersion forces going for it. If we compare that to say um, the one chloropentane, uh, molecule number two, well, it's got the chlorine bonded to a carbon which creates um, a dipole. So that molecule therefore can undergo dipole-dipole interactions. Now, if we switch over to molecule four, which is one pentanol, with that OH there, not only does it have London dispersion forces by virtue of being a molecule and um, a dipole-dipole interactions available to it by virtue of having a dipole, it also has the ability to do hydrogen bonding, which again is um, a really pronounced form of intermolecular force. Um, finally, the last one that we have is sodium chloride. Um, in general, when compared to molecules, salts have much, much higher melting points. Sodium chloride is actually one of the lower melting points for salts, and it is 810 degrees Celsius. Yowzas. That's hot. So dispersion forces are um, not only important for understanding chemistry, but they're also important for living systems. So cell membranes actually give us a really cool example of LDFs in action. And basically, if you look at the molecules that make up membranes and cells, um, you have a lipid tail, which is a bunch of carbons and hydrogens, not, um, no real appreciable difference in electronegativity, not polar. Then you have a polar phosphate head. So here we have some phosphate lipids, and it turns out that those lipid tails readily interact with each other, whereas um, the phosphate head is going to be more attracted to an aqueous interface. So they kind of intercalate themselves so that you have um, your charged and polar sides interacting with water, and then the lipid sides tend to interact with themselves. So in this particular example, we have a cholesterol molecule embedded into this membrane. The cholesterol has a lot of carbons and hydrogens in it, so it um, interacts nicely with those lipid tails. We'll talk more about solubility at another time and something called the like dissolves like principle, um, but it is um, in general thanks to these intermolecular forces. Not in general, it is thanks to these intermolecular forces. Um, and it's really neat when you take a step back and see how living systems organize themselves based off of these intermolecular forces. Another example is DNA. Again, we said that the hydrogen bonding is what allows um, adenines and thymines to combine together and then guanines and cytosines to combine together. Um, but also just the, um, the ladder of DNA. Um, the individual bases are kind of stacked up with each other. The London dispersion forces that they have on these different levels um, actually help maintain the stability of DNA. So another great example of London dispersion forces and intermolecular forces in living systems. 
And finally, um, the way that proteins interact with DNA, and this is out of the scope of Chem 110, but it's a cool, um, a cool application of these things. So DNA, we have these massive DNA molecules, and it turns out that based on the molecular geometry of proteins, cool, and the intermolecular forces that they can enjoy, like for example, hydrogen bonding, they'll interact with different sites on DNA so that they can lock in and do their thing. Really neat. Thanks, intermolecular forces. And thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day.